Welcome everyone to our day and in our conference. Uh, we will start today with Professor Jose Manuel Munoz from the Center, the International Center of Neuroscience and Ethics, a Centro de Internacional de Neurociencia y Ética, and University of Navarra in Spain. Uh, I, I just before presenting Jose, I have to tell a, a, a quick story. Uh, I got one day a, a, an email in my in my in my mailbox saying, "Well, uh, I, we've just seen your article in the University of Barcelona. It's very interesting. We are we are looking for someone to collaborate with us on on neuroethics. Uh, someone from Brazil." Uh, to collaborate with us from the university, uh, European University, and uh, it would be uh, good if we could talk to you. And I, I, I almost couldn't believe it. It is too good to be true. And uh, this is a, uh, uh, this is fishing. <laughs> it's it's. And I, then I looked it up. I said, okay, so Jose Manuel Muñoz, and I looked it up, and I said, wow, this this professor, he 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 worked with free will with neuroethics and neural law and neural rights, exactly the kind of things that, that I do research on. I, 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 so thank God it's not, a, it's not fishing. And then we started talking and collaborating and we became good colleagues ever since. And now I'm very happy to say that much more than colleagues, I can say Jose Manuel is a friend. And thank you very much to be here. We're all very anxious to, to hear from you. So, uh, Jose, Jose, thank you very much. So thank you very much, Renato. It's, uh, I'm very honored to be here with uh, you, uh, beloved friend, and all of you. Uh, I don't know why this is happening in my screen. Uh, There's a message in, in yeah. uh, I think it's my it's my fault. Yeah. So thank you so much. Um, my presentation will deal with the uh, hot topic of uh, neural rights. Uh, you maybe have heard about it. Um, as you know, I come from Pamplona, which is a northern city in Spain, very close to the border with uh, with France. With France, this is uh, a photo taken from my kitchen window uh, the last week. So <laughs> I'm very happy to to be here in in the sunny Rio. And well, my presentation. I will have five parts if I can respect time. Uh, the first of all, it's uh, the concept of neural rights. What are neural rights, uh, which is their current status and immediate challenges. And then I will pass to um, free will as a neural right. It is considered one of the new human rights proposed for, well, I will explain it later. Um, the third part is cognitive liberty another proposed uh, neural right. The fourth one is uh, mental augmentation and its, its challenges of promoting it uh, for access. And the last one um, will be uh, a complementary, a brief uh, complementary proposal from procedural law. <clears throat> okay, so I I just want to begin with a work definition of autonomy for the purposes of this uh, presentation. I'm going to use the following uh, definition, uh, which is taken from the Internet Encyclopedia of Philosophy, according to which autonomy is an individual's capacity for self-determination or self-governance, including moral autonomy, uh, which is the capacity to deliberate and to give oneself uh, the moral law, personal autonomy, 
the capacity to decide for ourselves and pursue a course of action in one's life. This type of autonomy encompasses uh, two of the neural rights that I'm going to comment on, uh, free will and cognitive liberty. And the third one is political autonomy, um, which is the property of having one's decisions respected, honored, and heeded within a political context. Um, this other type of autonomy is closely related um, to the neural right to fair access to mental augmentation, given the social and political implications that underlie this neural right. <clears throat> um, so I'm aware that uh, the concept of the autonomy is in itself uh, deserves further analysis, um, but it is not my objective here to address uh, this uh, analysis. Instead, I'm going to focus on the three neural rights that I just mentioned. So before going on to define what neural rights are, I think it would be appropriate to make a brief uh, introduction to the concept of neurotechnology and mention some of the most recently published um, studies. And this, I hope, can help us understand a little bit better the position of the advocates of neural rights. So uh, what are neurotechnologies? Um, well, the Potomac Institute for Policy Studies defines them as any technologies used to investigate modulate, repair, or improve the nervous system and its functioning. And this includes registration technologies, such as uh, brain decoding, uh, optogenetics, uh, uh, sorry, such as, such as brain decoding and brain imaging, um, and also intervention technologies, such as optogenetics, pharmaceuticals, brain implants, trans and intracranial um, stimulation, etc. <clears throat> um, these types of uh, neurotechnologies are generating growing interest among private investors. Um, these are um, the amounts invested in recent years in some of the largest uh, companies, uh, which are Neuralink, well known Neuralink, uh, but also Kernel, Halo, Neurable, uh, Bitbrain. Um, the main focus of interest uh, lies in the aspiration to find uh, brain-computer interfaces that, uh, as Elon Musk, which is uh, the owner of Neuralink, says, can allow us, in the end, to uh, be able to create a complete brain-machine interface in which uh, we can achieve all kinds of sciences with artificial intelligence. Okay, let's look at some of the recent achievements in the field of neurotechnology, both in the investigation of potential diagnoses and therapies and in the investigation of possible broader consumer directed applications. And I would like to uh, make it clear that there are uh, many technical nuances that should be taken into account when drawing, uh, you know, hasty conclusions about um, how these studies could be used in the case that uh, these technologies uh, can be used and widely developed. Uh, in any case, what I'm looking for here is not to do science fiction, um, but rather to reflect the rapid and impressive advance of neurotechnologies in recent times, given rise to results that at least uh, invite us to reflect uh, on their possible repercussions. A first example is a stimulation with focused ultrasound waves. With this type of neurotechnology, it has been possible to influence the behavior of non-human primates. In this case, uh, I think it, they are macaque uh, monkeys. Uh, well, neuroscientists have achieved this by producing uh, changes in, in their decisions, in the decisions of these monkeys, before they were to execute them. Another example uh, that I must uh, mention is, of course, uh, optogenetics, which is considered to be the most, uh, uh, the most curing next uh, technology uh, right now in neuroscience. In simple words, we could define it as a technique that works in two stages. Uh, the first one is uh, to uh, genetically modify neurons by introducing microbial genes uh, that regulate the synthesis of light sensitive proteins. And the second one, is uh, intracranial stimulation of these modified neurons 
by using light, uh, which according to its wavelength uh, can lead to the activation or inhibition of neuronal circuits. This technology has a privileged ability to uh, manipulate in an incredibly precise way the functioning of neural circuits. Uh, an example is this work published in Science, in which uh, neuroscientists managed uh, to induce um, visual type perceptual states in mice in absence of the stimulus that uh, should be uh, provoking them. In other words, it could be said that they managed to implant uh visual hallucinations in these animals uh, these are of um, this there are other studies in which hallucination also of a tactile auditory gustatory and olfactory type have been implanted both in mice and in non-human uh, primates uh, here is another example in this case it was possible to uh, manipulate uh behavior of the mice by making them extremely aggressive uh, these animals attack uh, fictitious prey, such as pieces of plastic as we can see um, so it can be seen that uh, with accurate knowledge of the neural circuits involved and with an appropriate uh, technology it is already relatively easy to influence animal cognition and behavior in ways that despite undeniable medical uh, applications also invited us to uh, fear that they may uh, negatively influence human beings in the future but as, as i say there are many possible positive applications of optogenetics here are some of them uh, for example um, to intervene in, in some types of blindness but uh, there is in fact a, a study case Publicated about this. Uh, chronic pain by inhibiting associated neurons so is another possibility. Epilepsy by inhibiting networks involved in seizures. Um, Parkinson's, uh, Parkinson's disease by activating sectors of the basal ganglia to decrease tremor and stiffness. And also Alzheimer's uh, disease by stimulating the hippocampus to retrieve information in early stages. Um, this is the case that I just mentioned. It's a study case published with um, optogenetics in which uh, scientists have been able to um, recover um, the sense of vision in, in, a, in a patient who has who, who lost his vision 40 years ago, I think, or so. Um, so it, it's important to highlight that optogenetics uh, still raises doubts about whether it will be uh, it will have wide applications in humans so far there is only in this uh, this published study so there are uh, doubts nowadays but um what if what if optogenetics uh, could finally be widely used in uh, in humans uh, there are authors who given the enormous potential of this technique to precisely activate or inhibit uh, certain neural circuits uh, have speculated on the possibility that its use may influence uh, memories in different ways for example implantation or modification of memories recovery of memories um, modification of the tone or so-called balance of a memory and also memory enhancement and given the decisively uh, decisive role of, uh, of memories in shaping our identity and agency. Um, this is not a small issue, I think. Another technique, another technique that arouses much interest among neuroscientists and uh, of course among neuroethicists uh, and also in the media, uh, by the way, is brain decoding. Um, in recent years, there have been great advances that have allowed patients with speech motor diseases to use their minds to write letter by letter, and in this way to be able to, uh, to communicate uh, in effective ways. Um, but the great aspiration of digital platforms is uh, that this type of neurotechnology can be used in the field of direct-to-consumer neurotechnologies. Uh, for example, Facebook funded an, an, an impressive study in which uh, it is shown that it could be possible to 
translate, so to speak, uh, neural sign signals, not just in letters, but in complete sentences. In other words, we are talking about uh, considering brain activity as a, uh, as a kind of language. Facebook, however, has stopped funding uh, the team that has achieved these impressive results. Uh, the reason is that in the medium term, um, this company don't see feasible that these results can be widely applied among the population. Uh, sorry. Um, the limitations are many, uh, but just to mention uh, an obvious one uh, to achieve these results, um, I have just mentioned, uh, it is necessary to implant an electrode plate on the brain surface. So intracranial surgery is necessary. However, there are other labs that are trying to develop non-invasive methods that are effective for producing so-called silent speech, that is uh, writing without saying a single word, um, but only imagining. And move it. I will do it. Oops, oops. I will try to move the. Uh... Yeah. I think I can. Hmm. It's it's. Sorry. Um. Well, as I was, as I was, uh, as I was saying, uh, there are other labs that are trying to develop non-invasive uh, methods that are effective for producing so-called silent speech, uh, that is writing without saying a single word, but only imagining it. And this is the case of the alter ego device that is being developed at the MIT. Uh, despite the fact that uh, there are many sensationalist headlines in the media about these types of, of devices, it should be made clear that uh, they are based on the decoding of motor signals directed at the articulatory organs of speech. Consequently, these devices are far from capable of reading minds, as I usually can read in the media. In fact, reading specific articulated thoughts does not seem feasible in the medium or even the long term, since thinking involves more than imagining words that are going to be spoken. And this does not mean, of course, uh, that there are not important repercussions of this research for issues such, such as the privacy of our brain data and how these data could be used by digital platforms, for example. It, I will comment more on this later. So as we have seen, um, there is a fine line between caution and fiction, uh, between neuroethics and neurohype. In my view, any debate about neuro rights in particular uh, should always take into account where this fine line is, because despite impressive advancements of neuroscience in recent years, this science is not without these problems uh, regarding how its results should be interpreted. Okay, let me uh, just let me uh, to leave the academic tone for a moment. Uh, it seems to me that. Uh, to reflect the limitations, uh, I'm talking about, uh, about neuroscience, to reflect these limitations, it can be funny to see how neuroscientists themselves, themselves joke on social networks about the relevance of some of their work. Here are some of the types of neuroscientific papers uh, they joke about. For example, the first one, we put an electrode somewhere new. The second one is with one billion in funding, we collected lots of data to be understood later. We found a fascinating result after five tries, but we can replicate it. And my favorite is this one. I believe my finding in four of, see? Yes. If you, if you could, I know it great. Uh, 
I stop? If I stop uh, sharing my screen and try it now. Yeah, yeah, maybe people people, people they're online are complaining that the, yeah, it's I, that the message is mm, uh, mm. kind of harming their I, their understanding. Yeah, but... just let me try it again. Yeah. So, <laughs> now it seems that it works finger crossed finger crossed uh so the last the last example the last is is this one i believe my finding in in four of six rats has real potential to change the world so um uh, i'll drop the humor now and i try to get uh, to get uh, serious again it is a case, in my opinion, that even when some of uh, when some new technology uh, cannot be fully uh, developed, it can be used to erode fundamental rights. This seems to be the case with a study conducted in some Chinese schools uh, a couple of years ago. In this study, school-age children were fitted with uh, electrode headgears so that their teachers could monitor. Uh, their their level of attention in, in in class the good news is that these devices had only three electrodes uh, i have spoken to several neuroscientists about this study and they all have told me the same thing uh, the quality of the signal obtained with only three electrodes is very poor um, which means that they uh, that these devices do not serve the, the purpose for which they seem to be uh, produced which is to uh, know the level of of attention of the students <clears throat> the bad news is that even if these devices are are garbage um, they can violate fundamental rights uh, aggravated in this case because the people uh, involved are are, are minors uh, these children can be uh, can be put under intolerable pressure to remain vigilant all the time for fear or of, of, of uh, I mean of, of reprisal uh, for, from their teachers or 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 their parents or their parents. Uh, not to mention the dangerous precedent uh, uh, set by trying to go this far uh, in the invasion of uh, individual privacy. So, in the face of both potential and, and actual uh, threats regarding the misuse of uh, neurotechnology, there is growing uh, there is a growing group of uh, scholars uh, calling for the incorporation of new human rights to protect human dignity. It, it must be said that, despite their name, these are not rights for the brain, but rights for the person. It is just that they are intended to protect people from being damaged through manipulation of their of their brains. The first published study uh, um, about neural rights was uh, this one by Marcello Ienca uh, from Italy and Roberto Andorno from uh, Argentina, uh, though they both uh, work in Switzerland. Uh, they call for the incorporation of four uh, new uh, rights. Uh, the first one is cognitive liberty. And the second one is mental privacy. Uh, then the third one is mental integrity. And the fourth one is uh, psychological uh, continuity. Uh, in an article published in an article published this year, um, Yenka developed a, a first formal standardized uh, definition for neural rights, which is, he defines as the ethical, legal, social, or natural principles of freedom or entitlement related to a person's cerebral and mental domain that is the fundamental uh, normative rules for the protection and preservation of the human brain and mind uh, these are the the three of the neural rights proposed by Yenka and Andorno as I just mentioned the first is cognitive liberty I will comment on it more uh, later but uh, 
in in few words uh it is aimed to uh, protect uh, against coercive use of neural devices uh, the second one is mental integrity aim to prevent damage to the mind uh, produced through the brain which is sometimes called brain hacking the third one is psychological continuity uh, which is a kind of well, it, it, it could be considered a, a prerequisite for for identity in in, in literature is is defined uh, this way uh, which is um, which is aimed to prevent non-consensual changes in the personality. Uh, this is called sometimes brainwashing, uh, alteration of, of memories. The fourth one, uh, which is the most developed neural right uh, at this moment, is mental privacy. Its objective is to protect mental information that can be inferred from brain data, also called neural data. Uh, that is to determine when, how, and to what extent this data can be disseminated or can be used. Uh, there are trends uh, in the development of consumer non-invasive uh, neurotechnologies uh, that invite us to reflect more on, on this uh, right. For example, um, the possibility to use uh, mental commands or passwords uh, or monitoring levels of attention, uh, as we have seen before, concentration or response to uh, stimuli. Um, a very, very uh, recent example is a study by Spotify Labs um, with steady state topography to measure brain electrical activity. And this uh, apparently um, has permitted they to infer uh, emotional intensity to different songs with the aim of offering personalized contents. But this also could serve um, to improve uh, psychological profiling or what uh, someone uh, sometimes is called uh, the digital phenotyping. I want to come back to I want to come back here to something I said previously, um, which is that you don't need to articulate thoughts to invade a person's uh, privacy. You can tell a lot about someone if you have enough information about her or him and know how to use this data. In particular, a risk that seems possible in the precise elaboration of psychological profiles and what some call digital phenotyping. Um, uh, well, until now, this has been done mainly by, by using contextual data based on behavior in social networks and internet search engines. Uh, however, projects such as the metaverse, for example, invite us to believe that soon consumers could see it as normal to place a device on their heads to interact with platforms. Then it could be relatively simple to add sensors of different kinds to these devices. What digital platforms seem to be seeking for is, so to speak, uh, the perfect profile by integrating not only contextual data, but also biometric and brain data. Any case, uh, the Yenka and Andorno proposal is not the only one when it comes to, to neural rights, but it was the first one, and it should be stated. There is another, another one led by Rafael Juste, um, a neurobiologist, a Spanish American uh, neurobiologist uh, based at Columbia, uh, Columbia University in New York, um, and the Neural Rights Foundation. Um, well, this foundation uh, proposes five neural rights. The first two are very similar to some of the rights that I mentioned before, um, proposed by Inca and Andorno. Uh, they are mental privacy and, and uh, personal identity. Uh, there is another right to which, uh, although it is exclusive to Eustace's uh, use proposal, I am not going to focus today on, on it, uh, which is protection against algorithmic bias. It is very interesting. Uh, 
I, I'm not going to talk about this today. So the, the two that I interest me most today are free will and fair access to, to mental documentation. I will soon comment on I will soon comment on them. Before that, let me briefly mention the legislative advances that have uh, occurred uh, thus far in, in relation to new rights. The first case is, um, is that of Chile. In this country, a constitutional reform has been accepted very, very recently, just a few weeks ago, that, uh, among other things, introduces mental integrity and mental privacy as fundamental rights. Uh, in addition, in this country, a neuroprotection law uh, has been also accepted. Uh, I think it was yesterday. Um, that allows a specific uh, specifying how these rights should be uh, specifically safeguarded. Another case, uh, also in Latin America, is precisely that of Brazil. Uh, where a bill is underway to regulate the collection and use of, uh, of brain, uh, brain data. In France, uh, there have also been recent advances. Uh, within a general bioethics law, they have incorporated an, art an article specifically dedicated to the protection of mental integrity. And the last example is, is that of my, of my country, of Spain, um, where this year um, a charter of digital rights has been published that, um, among other things, includes all the new rights proposed, not only by Juste, but also by Yen Canandorno. Uh, all of them are, are, are there. Uh, it is in Spanish, but I can translate it. Identity. Um, um, liberty, uh, mental privacy, uh, psychic uh, integrity or mental integrity, um, algorithmic bias, uh, and equal access to neurotechnologies. So all of them are, are, are there. Um, it must be said that unlike the cases of Chile, of Brazil and of, of France, Spain has opted for soft law, since this document has no formal normative link and has been prepared with subsequent legislative advances in, in mind. But what I like about the Spanish approach is the integration of neuro rights into a broader framework of ethics of digital technologies, thus forming a single legal ecosystem, so to speak. Um, the Charter of Digital Rights of Spain is closely linked to the national strategies of, of, of uh, artificial intelligence and digital immers immersion, and also to the creation of so-called uh, Spain Neurotech, which is expected to be a uh, world-class international center in, neuro in neurotechnology. Okay, we'll see. Uh, one of the five uh, lines of action for this new center will be, interestingly, um, the advance in the study of, of new rights and the ethics of neurotechnology. Beyond the advances, beyond the advances of the, uh, at the national level, there are also signs in the United Nations that invite us to believe that there will soon be starting a reflection about neurotechnologies within uh, this organization. Uh, this has been stated in their Secretary, Secretary General's report called Our Common Agenda uh, on the occasion of the upcoming 75 years of the Declaration of uh, human, human Rights. Uh, there are also um, scholarly projects underway on this issue in Latin America. Uh, here are a few that I have had the pleasure of participating in. For example, there's a working group specifically aimed to analyze neuro rights uh, within the Asociación Mexicana de Neuroética, Mexican Association of Neuroethics. Uh, our, our, our belief friends, uh, our Renato is part of this group. Um, 
Another example is a PhD program uh, created in Mexico by, by two national institutes. Um, in ACIPE, which is a, an institute um, of law, and also the National Institute for um, Neurology and Neurosurgery. As far as I know, this is the, the first PhD program that integrated neuro rights as one of their lines of research. A third example uh, is the, um, the first uh, Ibero-American conference of, uh, about neuro rights, which has been uh, taking place uh, last week or two weeks ago. Uh, two weeks ago. The last, um, uh, the last example of uh, work in Latin America about this, uh, which seems to me quite uh, promising, uh, is the one that has just been launched in Argentina, uh, thanks to an international seminar on neurosciences and neuro rights held by the Chamber of Deputies of this country. Uh, this event has been, um, I think, has been useful to start a, a project to create a joint congressional and senate commission to develop legislative advances linked to new social and technology and technological challenges including uh, new rights so to end this part of my talk i would like to briefly mention the, the control dilemma also known as calling rich dilemma in relation to the ethics of uh, technology. Well, one version of this dilemma could be the following. Should we regulate neurotechnology before it is consolidated, thus risking slowing its development, or should we wait for it to take hold and then evaluate its ethical impacts, even at the risk that, that it may be too late? Though there are other possible normative approaches not based on human rights, the scholars that recommend creating neuro rights seem, in any case, to have opted uh, for the precautionary principle, thus agreeing with, uh, for example, with Ramon Cajal, who once uh, said that almost all the ills of people and individual individuals arise from not having known how to be prudent and energetic during a historical moment that will never return. So I will pass to, I will move to uh, the second part of my presentation okay um which is, which is free will as a as a neuro right um in my presentation in in july i mentioned two i i mentioned two limitations that uh in my view free will has to incorporate it to uh, a declaration of of neuro rights which were philosophical multidimensionality um uh, and ultimate control. Uh, I will not focus on them um, today. Um, uh, instead, I will focus on two things that I think uh, are important, uh, which are cultural contextualization and regulatory fitting. Uh, there are interdependencies among these two issues. Um, so, for example, in uh, this is uh, this is something that we uh, we are uh, we have recently worked with uh, Karen Herrera Ferra and, and other colleagues in in, in Mexico um, about the contextualization the cultural contextualization of free will um, and some of the works we have uh, cited uh, are the following for example uh, this one. It's a study with Singaporean and US children, showing, which showed that um, while the former were more likely to elaborate on lack of free will by referencing punishment and or, and or having to seek permission from authorities, the later tended to endorse that uh, the freedom to act against norms. So it seems to be uh, an important um, cultural difference in how free, freedom or free will is understood. Um, additionally, Bernunas and, and colleagues uh, revealed that culturally diverse lexical expressions of free will, namely in the Chinese, Hindi, Lithuanian, and Mongolian languages, 
do not refer to the same concept of free will. And the authors conclude that um, the concept of free will has no cross-culturally universal conceptual content. We have, uh, we, we could listen this week to impressive talks about, about this. Um, second, that most of the reviewed studies on belief in free will were based on, on the so-called weird examples, where weird means Western, educated, industrialized, rich, and democratic. And democratic. And the authors also conclude that the term free will is inadequate for cross-cultural research. In another cross-cultural study, Wisniewski uh, and colleagues showed that believing in a dualistic self uh, that is made up of a physical brain and a non-physical mind seems to have a decisive influence on believing in free will, uh, pointing out that uh, religious and after the beliefs are, are a possible cause. These findings invite us to consider culturally shaped factors such as social norms, languages, and beliefs as fundamental factors within an international debate aimed to find a consensus definition of human rights in general and free will in particular. Another consideration intimately related to this has to do with the question of whether it is necessary um, to include free will as a new human right, or rather as an extension of one, con uh, um, considering that freedom of choice and action seem to be expressed for a different culturally shaped everyday context by several articles in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, um, which are, for example, freedom of, of freedom of thought, conscience, beliefs, popular will in elections, etc. These rights uh, proclaim in the declaration became mandatory in binding instruments such as the European Convention for the Protection of Human Rights and Fundamental Freedoms by the Council of Europe, the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights by United Nations, the American Convention of Human Rights by, by the Organization of uh, American uh, uh, States, the Af African Charter of Human and People's Rights by the Organization of African Unity, and the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities by the United Nations. In all these declarations, freedom of choice appears to be the white framework within which free will may be exercised. Distinctively, the Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples by, by the United Nations addresses the, exer the exercise of autonomy from a group or collective perspective as the right to self-determination understood in political, cultural, and social terms rather than individual ones. Um, as, we, as, as, as we see, fundamental and unique contextual and culturally shaped perceptions, interpretations, and meanings underlie many of the neuro rights related um, brain and mind issues. As a result, the given, the given value, importance, priority, or even sacredness of these traits may vary between countries, contexts, and cultures. Moreover, culture, as embedded in a context uh, and a country, plays uh, a relevant role on whether, when, and how to address um, a problem through regulation, especially, especially of any tool that could possibly impact not only the brain and its function, but also the mind. As such, the perceived needs, benefits, risks, and threats will partly determine the development, use, value, and priority of such brain tools, which is instrumental to achieve a universal understanding of consensus definition of neural rights. Uh, thus, since every country and context, whether developed, emerging, or, or um, developing, owns a specific, a specific cultural heritage, alternative, uh, alternative sociocultural perspectives should be expected to affect the use of neuroscience and neurotechnology and artificial intelligence. Um, but as I mentioned, since every country uh, has a context, it's perceived dimensional impact. The assessment of potential threats to the human condition, 
uh, and the need to develop a specific regulatory frameworks seem uh, important important issues. Further considerations in the expected one size fits all consensus definition of some proposed neuro rights, such as cognitive liberty, mental integrity, personal identity, and free will, are needed as certain cultures might not perceive this concept as a threat, uh, let alone as requiring universal legal protections. For, for instance, there are certain, uh, certain cultures for which an altered state of consciousness through ethnopharmacology is essential for cultural identity and belonging, as is the case of the Wixarika indigenous group, also called Huicholes, who make a pilgrimage every year through the desert to reach the Cerro del Quemado in Mexico, where their gods live uh, with the traditional consumption of peyote at the end of the journey as part of their religious ritual and spiritual experience. While, while we agree that the human being should be universally protected through specific rights related to the brain and mind, we urge um, well, not, not yours, no, it's not the, the word, but we think that reflection on the proactive inclusion of uh, transnational, cross-cultural and contextual considerations and concerns to contribute to the, to the global discourse on the development of an international consensus definition and implementation of new rights uh, in, would be interesting. Um, this inclusion does not mean an endorsement of ethical relativism, but rather a call to take into account both context and culture to foster. First, a technical definition which, uh, with, um, with a scientific and philosophical basis of concepts that will shape these new rights. Second, um, the manipulation of some features of the human essence, uh, which are the core um, at the core of what is intended to be protected. And third, uh, the implementation of rights within the framework of universality. Um, for instance, and the sorry, for instance, the Indigenous and Tribal Peoples Convention by the International Labour Organization in 1989 concerned peoples in regard to health and other matters listed in Article 30, providing a general legal structure of human rights respect while considering cross-cultural aspects. Given these, uh, these uh, inter intercultural differences in the importance given to the protection of free will, a first option would be, uh, could be to rule out its inclusion in future international new rights treaties. Uh, however, um, there is a long tradition of considering freedom, autonomy, and identity as valuable objects of protection in, in several international documents, such, uh, such as the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, the Convention on the Rights of the Child, um, just to mention two, two examples. Thus, uh, for the sake of regulatory continuity, we believe that a second option could be worth exploring, which is discussing and formulating a minimal definition of free will and also of other new rights. This may be, we believe this may be acceptable in terms of consensus by different cultural and legal traditions. Um, although such a definition might not close the philosophical debate, um, it, could be, it could be ethically operational in that it would help to preempt misinterpretations based on legislative uh, loopholes. So, okay. Um, I will move on to, to another you know, right, which is cognitive liberty. This, um, actually this right was not firstly proposed, but um, was not firstly proposed but, um, by Yenka and Adorno. Uh, it was proposed by other authors, such as uh, Sentencia, for example, at the beginning of this century. Uh, this principle is, is aimed to uh, mental self-determination and assumes, assumes freedom of thought and conscience. There are different definitions for, for cognitive liberty. Um, 
one of them is this by by uh, Christoph Boblitz in Germany. Uh, he defines cognitive liberty as the right to alter one's mental states with the help of neuro tools, as well as the right to refuse to do so. Mm, so there's a, a, a positive side, uh, a, a positive right here, and also a negative uh, right. Uh, you can use, you can proactively use uh, neuro tools, and you can refuse to. Um, Ian Calandorno don't understand cognitive liberty this way. Uh, they think that the most important part is the negative right, uh, which is the protection against coercive use of neuro devices. Uh, they, Ian Calandorno, they consider uh, cognitive liberty as a legal prerequisite for the rest of neuro rights. Um, uh, a kind of neurocognitive substrate of all other liberties, as they have uh, stated in, in their article. <clears throat> so um, here I, I would like to, to, to put together um, the definitions of free will and also of, of cognitive uh, liberty, uh, since they, at first glance, Seem, uh, um, seem to be aimed to protect the same things, but uh, there are differences. Uh, because while free will entails, uh, I, would, I, would, I would say that it entails an ontological conception of personal autonomy, cognitive liberty refers either to practical freedom uh, of thought or to a specific practical, practical choices. So uh, a challenge, a possible challenge uh, may be to explore conceptual links between the rights of free will and, and cognitive liberty. Um, for example, by analyzing whether they are mutually exclusive or if they are, uh, whether they are complementary or interdependent. Um, uh, maybe it, it would be worth exploring to to uh, to work on a uh, an umbrella right, so to so to say, uh, which can encompass uh, both uh, both rights, both cognitive liberty and free will. But it is an initial idea idea. So I, it is I will be working on it, but I I have no. <laughs> Uh, I have no other definition still. Um, another, another issue with cognitive liberty uh, has to do with, uh, with the use of drugs, uh, with psychiatry and with social safety. Um, cognit cognitive liberty could be a valuable means to, to protect aut autonomy, but might present additional challenges. For example, on the use of drugs for recreational purposes, uh, as it entails unique multidisciplinary considerations and unsolved problems. Some of these issues include individual phenomenology on drug intoxication, diverse and ambiguous legal and policy approaches, negative social and political implications, the medicalization of addiction, relevant implications on free will and emerging considerations of cognitive liberty. To illustrate the experience of, um, well, this is, some, uh, this is something that I have not uh, worked alone, and this is uh, a, a contribution by a, by a colleague in this, in this article, but I think it is, it's an interesting point. Um, to, um, to illustrate the experience of drug intoxication is a unique psychological state that has few, if any, substitutes for many users. Uh, drug users aim for certain immediate and gratifying physical, emotional, and, and cognitive experiences in spite of the uh, uncertain uh, and knowledge and non-immediate risks, uh, negative effects, or outcomes that may even have serious and lethal consequences. <laughs> Um, but despite these caveats, there are global contradictory legal postures between mainly prohibitionist public policies and to a lesser extent, 
the non-criminalization of the free use of drugs. Um, additionally, the approach of, of drug trafficking in, uh, unfortunately, in, 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 many, um, in many nations has lacked scientifically based knowledge, uh, resulting in increased poverty, violence, and, and I mean, and, 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 and racial disparities. Uh, in this sense, um, the individual phenomenology of neurotechnologies, the potential addiction to their use, and the regulation of their use as a positive human right uh, become a significant concern, um, um, especially in some Latin American countries uh, where issues such as regulation, enforcement, compliance, and monitoring of the production and use of such neurotechnologies have been uh, reported. The fourth part of, of this talk is about mental uh, augmentation. Uh, it's, it's challenges of promoting uh, fair, fair use, uh, sorry, fair access to these, uh, to mental augmentations uh, uh, technologies. Um, the right to equal access to mental augmentation is characterized by the following assertions. There should be established guidelines at both international and national levels regulating the use of mental enhancement neurotechnologies. These guidelines, these guidelines, these guidelines, sorry, should be based on the principle of justice and guarantee equality of access. Although pertinent and feasible in many contexts, this right will require, in my opinion, further reflections as it poses uh, additional challenges. Uh, for example, um, the term referred to neuro or mental enhancement, as well as the scope and concerns within the Hispanic literature, although conveyed in many ways, also exhibit significant differences from the Anglo-American perspective. This is something that has been uh, has been published by uh, Laura Cabrera and, and Karen Herrera Ferra. Um, a second issue is that enhancement uh, as mandatory by the state um, would require reallocating poor or, or scarce uh, neuroscience and technology in countries with a discrepancy between the required level of mental health treatment and the actual level of treatment that is provided. Um, a third, a third issue, in, in our opinion, is that um, enhancement, if established as a human right, could lead to further inequality and social injustice within and between countries, which would counter the well-meaning goal of said right. Um, some potential risks are, are the following. Um, social pressure towards those uh, well, this is something that uh, has been, uh, uh, of course, the, the, this, this issue has been uh, deeply worked by, by Adina. Uh, uh, here are, are some things that, that she has stated. Uh, uh, other things are, are from uh, an article by Diego Borbon at Colombia. Um, sorry if I, if, I, if, I, if I cite you uh, unequitably. <laughs> I, I hope so not. Um, so, um, potential risks, for example, are that social pressure towards those people who do not want to be near enhanced uh, and who might thereby feel uh, cognitively inferior to those who do expand their mental capacities. This social pressure may even cause, uh, cause social friction between supporters and detractors of mental augmentation. Um, another possible risk is that um, possible uh, incomp incompatibilities with other new rights, such as personal identity. We should think about how, how enhancement could affect self-perception self and interrupt psychological continuity as it would make enhanced individuals ask themselves to what extent their abilities are really theirs. Uh, a third risk is uh, decreasing diversity, for example, Sociocultural and religious heterogeneity and indigenous cosmovisions, uh, as people progressively ex exercise the right to mental augmentation uh, in accordance with socially homogeneous standards. And a fourth risk is rise of inequalities 
regarding um, regarding people's cognitive abilities as a consequence of the generalized mental augmentation in the population. Um, I mean, enhancements would uh, merely uh, could merely exacerbate pre-enhancement biological differences uh, between individuals. Um, furthermore, neuroenhancement, neuro if, if introduced as a, as a human right, could foster uh, discriminatory attitudes towards disabilities as it seems to promote uh, biased understanding in medicine to correct, normalize, or improve appearance functioning or, or behavior, as this is the case in, in deaf culture. In this light, uh, in this light, the, the transnational use of neuroscience and technology and the potential use of, of uh, scope of artificial intelligence calls for the understanding and inclusion or, of contextual and cultural differences, as well as the resulting particular uh, neuroethical, legal, and social issues for proper global regulation. This may improve not only global trans translational and transnational safety, viability, compatibility, and value, but also efforts to enhance global benefits of uh, neuroscience and technology and artificial intelligence research and its applications. So to, to, uh, to, so to finish my presentation, I would I would make a brief, uh, uh, an outline of a brief proposal from a procedural law that could complement your rights. I will, I will briefly explain. Um, okay, uh, human rights as a legal expression of the human dignity on which they are based have the function of protecting dignity from situations in which it is at risk of being harmed. It is in this context that historically uh, rights have been required to adapt to novel circumstances that arise from social shifts, especially when it comes to current developments in science and technology. These developments have an increasing capacity to influence people's lives in general, in general positively, as is the case for the development of neuroscience and, and neurotechnology for psychiatry. Psy psy psychiatric disorders. Um, nevertheless, there, are, uh, there may also be situations in which these developments and their applications could potentially harm a person's dignity as well as their goods and values. Uh, thus, um, extending the protection of, of existing rights to, to these new realities or, development or, or developing new rights and concepts that guarantee the, the protection of human dignity is probably um, a good possibility. This is known as the expansive theory of human rights, which consists in um, that under no circumstances can the scope of existing rights be reduced, and that on the contrary, they are in a permanent, a permanent expansion to protect dignity in the face of new and emergent um, circumstances and vulnerability risks. However, human rights um, human rights are more uh, more a, a more a beacon than a concrete instrument to which states can resort in their particular sphere of action. Thus, it should be noted that to strengthen the respect for human rights, these states have the obligation to formally secure secure them through public policies and, and legal mechanisms. So, and this is a, a proposal I am working on with a, an Argentine a colleague, which is called uh, Jose Angel Marinaro. Um, so, um, the risk of the misuse of neurotechnology moves us in the, in the direction of the need to innovate in legal resources that, that uh, give citizens uh, rapid protection against the diversified ways of affecting mental autonomy. We would achieve little if we only dedicated ourselves to, this, to designing substantial guarantees, such as neural rights, without endowing them with repair mechanisms that are also adequate for the new times. We propose to strengthen neural rights with the protection of the right to freely dispose 
of our mental states and contents with a necessary and novel instrument that can be used in procedural law. We believe that the cases susceptible to immediate protection through this new instrument refer to those that violate mental self-determination self or, or uh, mental autonomy. Uh, that is the freedom of an individual to control uh, their mental processes, their cognition, and, and even their, their, their own conscience. It has a close uh, relationship with freedom of thought, uh, long recognized in literature and with the newest conception, uh, newest concept of cognitive liberty. Uh, this new legal instrument is, um, is, is conceived as an action of rapid processing in the face of illegal actions committed not only by the state, but also by private offenders. So, uh, to to finish, uh, I will I would like to to read some um, some overall uh, overall consequences, some overall uh, conclusions. Um, yeah, well, the concept of free will brings with it conceptual, philosophical, and, and cultural difficulties that hinder its inclusion as a new right. Uh, cognitive liberty, rather than, than being a prerequisite for free will, uh, appears to have complex interdependent relationships with it. Uh, it might be worth exploring a mental autonomy in your right that could encompass both free will and cognitive freedom. Uh, we need to innovate in legal resources that give citizens rapid protection against the diversified ways of affecting mental autonomy, thus complementing substantial new rights with procedural instruments. Um, and more ethical and conceptual reflection is needed before implementing access to new enhancement um, as a universal right. So I would like to, uh, I would like uh, very much to conclude with a little literary tri uh, tribute, um, uh, you know, yeah, throughout these days in this uh, magnific magnificent historical uh, building, we are discussing uh, a large number of topics of, of great interest. Each of the thought-provoking, uh, inspiring talks I have, I have heard uh, has dealt with free will or autonomy more in general with different perspectives. Um, but despite the, the diversity of approaches, uh, I think we are all, uh, I think we are all moved by the same, que the same question. Uh, which is, uh, is freedom in any of its forms really possible in a world full of physical, biological, um, social, economic, political constraints? Uh, it is, of course, a very difficult question to answer and to which we will not find a, a solution here, of course. But it is certainly uh, worth asking and investigating how, or investigating about it. Uh, so just let me put it in, 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 in Don Quixote's words. Uh, Freedom, Sancho, is one of the most precious gifts that heaven has bestowed upon men, not treasures that the earth holds buried or the sea conceals can compare with it. Uh, for freedom, as for honor, life may and should be ventured. And on the other hand, captivity is the greatest evil that can fall to the lot of men. So... Uh, muito obrigado, muitas graças. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, José. I, I, I have a hundred thousand questions, but I think I will open for yeah for the audience before. Otherwise, I will monopolize this. <laughs> Yeah, uh, I have a very, very simple question. Uh, it's about the applications of such techniques as brain reading, brain reading, especially the biofeedback that you showed, mm -hmm. like the the caps, the EEG caps. Um, for example, I mean, I, I I participate in a tutorial about biofeedback with G caps for children. And we had like great applications of it. And there are kids that instead of taking Risalin, are using biofeedback 
to to overcome uh, ADAD. So I mean, uh, at the other side, we can be collecting data. Yeah, their schools collecting data from those th those kids from the brain of those kids. So uh, my question is, how we would promote some form of international debate to create policies to regulate by law mm -hmm. the possible applications, the possible positive applications, and how do you create a consensus about which applications? are not morally defensible and have to be ruled out by law. That's that's my point. Um, there are many, many possible uh, uh, approaches. I think that in the case that you are, you are mentioning, um, the positive applications are, are, are obvious. Uh, um, there's the, the, the approach which can be based only on 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 consent. Uh, Jennifer Chandler uh, spoke the other day about this. The 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 newest uh, approach, uh, which uh, many of the near rights uh, uh, authors have uh, are developing, is a uh, an approach based on a opt-in option when when it when it comes to 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 give your consent to to the data. Um, but my my answer would be that there's no definitive answer to this. As as far as I know, there is no there is not a unique framework. But I agree that um, it is a, a very difficult challenge to to address. Actually, part of my question depends on the idea, how do we regulate the, the devices in itself? How do you know they are, they are not collecting that? I mean, you sign informal consent, I'm just using the ZG cap for training my brain to overcome AGAG, you're uh, modulating on yeah, waves. Yeah. I mean, I'm signing a contract that says that I mean, I'm just using for medical purposes, mm -hmm. but how do mm -hmm. I know that they are not collecting data secretly? That, that's mm -hmm. my point. What kind of regulations you can have to guarantee mm -hmm. those, those neural rights, this neural privacy to, mm -hmm. to be precise. My mm -hmm. question is neural price. How do you guarantee the, 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 neural the, privacy? The fact is that you cannot know if they are collecting data. <laughs> uh, um, the, the trace of the of brain data, uh, are very difficult. There is a recent document published by, uh, by the way, for uh, uh, of many many experts in the field uh, in in the U.S., in Germany, and so on. Um, and one of the main points of the of the document is, pre is precisely uh, that that you have just mentioned, which is the the, the how could uh, brain data be uh, collected and used. Uh, especially when it comes to uh, not conscious states. Uh, mm. so, yeah. mm. Should it be legalized to use this this kind of data without consent? Criminalized. Criminalized. Yeah. Should we make that a crime and or just heavy fees? Uh, if we could, if we can make uh, commit a crime. Uh, Using this kind of data without uh, ah, authorization. If I if I think that it should be well, if if you are breaking the law, uh, I mean, if, if we if we make a, a a legal framework that clearly states that uh, we we should do this, I think it it's a a very pressing issue, mental privacy, and 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 has many many. Um, Eventual risks that are uh, that could be uh, absolutely um, destructive for our societies, in my opinion. So I think that it could be. It I think that pursuing this in in in, in criminal law, it, it, I think it's not uh, it's not too much. I think it it could be a, a good approach. Yeah. 
So wonderful talk. Thank you. Um, Thanks. Well, so, so even a hammer, so any tool, so a hammer can be used for good or evil. You can use it to build a house, which is good. So, sorry, or can you speak louder, lo please? Can, can you speak uh, louder? Oh, I'm sorry. Um, a tool can be used for good or evil. For example, a hammer can be used to build a house or kill a person. And so it's the tool itself is neutral. Even an atom bomb could be used to deflect an asteroid. So perhaps the focus should not be on the tools, but on the purposes. But that's just a, a point. Um, the question I have is, it seems to me that your focus is on the rights of the individual against um, infringement by external forces. And in this sense, it's a little bit like um, the United States Bill of Rights in our constitution, which was aimed at thwarting tyranny. But there's another danger, right? So Orwell described a, wor a world in which tyranny rises, external forces destroy the individual. But uh, Huxley, in his Brave New World, described a very different sort of mind control system in which people were seduced into compliance through pleasure and distraction. And these devices offer a different kind of um, danger than the ones you're describing of external control, namely the danger of internal um, self-destruction. So in the work of Milner and Olds, in the, they took rats and they put electrodes in their septum, pellucidum, and the rats would press a bar and they would feel pleasure. And they would press the bar for pleasure and not the bar to get food until they starved to death. So one other danger of these devices, apart from external control, is enhanced addiction, uh, a loss of autonomy, as in, you know, if I could give myself a permanent orgasm, would that be good for my career as a pilot? You know, probably not. So there, there's all kinds of other dangers than the ones you're describing, I think. There's the issues of external control, but also of internal seduction and loss of control. And I'm wondering if you're thinking that maybe there needs to be an extension also to address these sort of Huxley kinds of uh, losses of individual autonomy, rather than the Orwellian losses of I autonomy. I absolutely agree. Um, I think we are living in dangerous times in, in the sense that uh, I think that many people is not aware of uh, which are the risks in what comes to, to, to privacy and the kind of uh, profiling that digital platforms, platforms are, are pushing to, to achieve. And uh, I think that brain data, uh, so, to, so to say, probably they don't have, uh, they, they will not bring a, a new problem, but will make bigger problems that are now uh, in our societies. Uh, um, about the, the, the neutrality of tools, I am not sure because you, if you, uh, for example, if you build a, a bridge which has a specific, uh, specific uh, height, for example, for some type of, of, of vehicles, uh, it is not neutral. Only a specific type of, of car or, or, or van can can pass so uh but, but we, we could talk about this later hmm. thanks for the talk um i have a couple comments one to uh, peter's uh point about the huxley and brave new world i think we already see that with um hmm. video games right that's that's the kind of thing that they're doing hmm. um i don't know that with neurotechnologies, it would be a difference in kind. It might be a difference in, you know, application, but it seems like we're dealing with that kind of problem already. Um, and I also think you're on the right track in questioning whether this right to free will makes sense or, or at least needs to be explicated very carefully, because if free will means anything like the sort of thing that we have been debating, where we have a question of whether we have it, and it's a metaphysical question, you can't legislate it, right? You can't just say, suppose we don't have free will, you can't just say, well, we have a right to it, and therefore it's the law, yeah. right? And so 
the law must be concerned with something other than that. Um, and so getting clear on what that is, uh, I think makes sense. So I don't think that including this as a right mm -hmm. is clarifying at all. Mm. Um, but uh, the question that I have for you is whether you think that um, the status of you know, neurodata has some, whether there's anything special about it or whether it's just another kind of data. Like, do we need to do philosophical theorizing about the nature of brain data in particular because it has some, some you know, special difference between that and all other data that allows companies to predict us or control mm. us or, you know, mm. cater to our desires or whatever it is that they want to use us for? Mm. Um, or is it just another kind of data that we can kind of use mm. blanket policies? They may be hard to find anyway, but. Uh, sorry, question. Uh, I do not work empirically with, with brain data, but uh, when I, I have talked with uh, some empirical neuroscientists on this. Uh, they say that uh, brain data are um, particularly difficult to, uh, individual brain data are particularly difficult to access and, and, and modify and, and, uh, and, and erode because. Um, they are used in uh, in uh, predictive models, uh, which integrate integrate uh, huge uh, huge uh, quantity and many 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 data of thousands of individuals to make these uh, predictive models uh, more uh, feasible, and is uh, in a way they could be. They say that in in some way brain data are are, are like mixable uh, individual data are mixable with other data from other uh, other uh, patients or other individuals and this can be uh, difficult to exercise your right for your rights as is stated in the european uh, legislation about this uh, on personal data it is difficult to access your data and, and and make your particular decisions about how these data are being used um, and about your first comment, it is funny because uh, uh, two or three years ago, I I make this comment more or less uh, like you that it integrate free will has no no sense in in many ways, and and it was published in a top tier journal, <laughs> a scientific journal. But what I said is just common sense, <laughs> and it is is very funny because uh, for us. Uh, these comments would be absolutely obvious. <laughs> uh, I think, thank, thank you. Uh, I think Thomas wants to ask a question. Thomas, are you there? Sorry, I, I had my feeds off to make it easier. Um, you're, so you're first, a bit, was a great you're a talk. bit low. You, you could speak a bit louder, please. Ah. Okay. okay. Good. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, it's a great talk. Uh, there's an awful lot in the talk. So there's, uh, there are a bunch of questions I could ask. First, I thought I would make a suggestion, uh, which will be quick. And then I had a question that was uh, in some ways similar or builds on what Adina asked. I have other questions, but we'll wait and see if others have questions first. The suggestion is that I wouldn't place a whole lot of stock in the article you cited uh, by the team, the Bernius team on the weird free will belief stuff, I was very surprised that that got published. The Wisniewski piece you reference, they had a thousand participants per condition. And in the other study, they have less than a hundred in all five conditions. They don't use a standardized measure. They don't use validated. I mean, I, I'm just surprised it was published. So I wouldn't use that as a reason to make any claims about um, free will and whether we, what it means and all that. It's not to say I don't think more of that research shouldn't be done. I just think it's not a very good, uh, it didn't make a very good contribution. I think it's surprising. I think it's only because it cut against what most people say that it got published. But in any event, 
a related question is, so you tell me you want to build a right to free will, a neuro sort of neuro right to free will. And I say, well, look, I don't even believe there is such a thing. So you're going to have a, I'm going to have a right. It's like having, for me, it's like having a right to being a ghost. But what I do think is that autonomy is important. Freedom is important. Liberty is important. And what I want to ask is once you've, if you've sketched out what those mean, what is left for the free will construct to do? Because it's going to have to be a remnant that isn't captured by those three things. And if you look at practical cases where you care about the construct, what, what can't you get out of the three things that nearly everyone's going to agree are important rather than the thing we don't even agree we have or it's not clear what it is that we think we have? Whereas those are, we might disagree about the limits of autonomy, freedom, and liberty and their application, but we're all on roughly the same page about there being valuable, um, there being the sorts of things we should protect. And so what, what, what additional mileage do you get out of free will that just doesn't involve you in uh, metaphysical disagreements that are counterproductive to the task you're interested in? So that, I, I take it that's in some ways related to what Adina said, but that was my, that's my main question. I've got more questions later if people uh, don't have other questions, but thanks again. The talk was great. Thank you so much, Thomas. Uh, your comments uh, are always uh, great. Uh, regarding your question, in fact, I, I, uh, I think I agree with you in, in many parts of my, of my talk. I have, go, I have went this way. I mean, uh, free will is, we have commented on it uh, extensively these days, it's very problematic. It's a metaphysical loaded term. And uh, even though I believe that free will exists, but this is another, another thing, uh, I agree that this, uh, it could be very difficult to find how free will could add something new uh, to the concepts of autonomy uh, or, or or freedom. Uh, so this is why I am uh, trying to think about uh, if we could uh, integrate in a unique framework, for example, the 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 rights to cognitive liberty and and so on, to make a a more encompassing right that. Uh, maybe would be not uh, metaphysically loaded as free will, but can be useful. And, and thank you so much for your suggestion about the, the weird <laughs> publication. Uh, uh, I, will look more, uh, I will look more at it uh, because I think it is very important to, to make our, our, our points more, more solid to, to go more on, on this kind of studies. Thank you so much. Of course, thanks again. Thank you, Professor, for your speech. Um, I was uh, thinking about uh, when you mentioned uh, free will as a right, and I also thought about what um, Professor said, um, Professor Adina said that, um, well, if the law says it exists, we'll ease our job on deciding if it does or not. But I was also thinking while you were speaking that when the International Criminal Court was trying to make the rules that would um, be followed. There were a lot of discussion on the meaning of um, some concepts that would be used in that, uh, in that court, such as rape, um, uh, crimes against uh, humanity. All those were problems for the law because the definition, the understanding, the many countries that were under um, that same flag um, wouldn't agree on. And I, I, I believe there is um, a problem with the definition and the understanding of um, uh, free will when we think about um, what people understand, especially because there is usually this metaphysical um, understanding to it. But um, I would like to know if you think that these understandings and definitions are the, the real problem about um, regulating uh, free will. And also, if you would understand that regulating free will is a way of regulating 
uh, autonomy and uh, freedom, just like um, Professor Thomas said, or if it would be more like um, Professor Peter in one of his lectures mentioned uh, William James saying that uh, his first act of free will would be believe in free will, or which I mean is um, our right to believe free will and act upon it, or are we really trying to def to make a definition so we can rule on that? Okay, so uh, if I understood well, okay. Uh, so uh, first of all, I think that the right to believe in free will is just like the right to believe in other in another things i mean you you can believe in whatever you want uh is freedom of, of belief in, in many ways so i think that in my opinion maybe i'm wrong but in my opinion uh trying to regulate specifically the right to believe in free will uh, makes no sense um and about the your 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 comment i think that uh conceptual definitions are very important for law because uh uh, if you don't have a solid uh, concept, a solid definition for a, for a concept, then law uh, does not help. Even it is worse to regulate something if it is not well defined. Uh, so I think that that concrete uh, definitions are needed. It's it is uh, it is true that, for example, in documents such as the Declaration of Human Rights, definitions are more widely understood because they're. They, they are general principles of, of, of freedom and you know, but yeah i think that concrete definitions are very important for now so uh i i have i have a lot of questions but i can always i mean we are here so i I'd, I'd really like to call thomas again he said he has other questions uh thomas i really liked your example uh of free will uh, the, the right to free will is being like the right to, to be a ghost. I, I usually use another example. It's like saying someone has the right to free will. It's like saying you have the right to have a soul. And yeah, yeah. It, it's very contentious because a lot of people are going to say, yeah, but that, that doesn't mean anything because souls just don't exist. I mean, <laughs> for some, a lot of people, I mean, a lot of people still believe in souls and we would love to to have the right to have a soul but i mean still it's very contentious so please thomas you have the word yeah so um i wondered about a, a, another way in which these rights are interesting because i i am quite confident that if when when facebook is done with the metaverse and they give people the option of giving up their rights that you're wanting to give them in order to have free access, billions of people will just give it away. You can spend all the time you want to protect them, and then they will just voluntarily give it away. And so these rights are interesting in that way. I, I can't, I can't, I'm not supposed to be allowed to sell myself into slavery. So that's not a right that I'm, I'm allowed to give away, for instance. But I, I can, the, the, these sorts of rights are rights that, that I, I can, and I think most people actually will, will, will give, not all of them, of course, you're, you've got a lot of rights on the table, but at least some of them, I think people will just give up in the name of expediency and cost efficiency. And so I wonder, I want, well, that's part, so part of it, and this is related, I think, uh, in some ways to what, um, to what Gabrielle asked earlier about uh, the riddle and stuff where you know, people are just going to, um, you can protect them, but if they have the ability to, uh, to just voluntarily give them up, they, they will, and then they, they, they become very hard to, uh, to guarantee. Or what does it mean to say that everyone's got this right when what I think there are 2 billion people in the world are on Facebook? So what does that look like? That was one question. I had another question about the criminal law stuff, if you wanna talk about that, but I'd be happy to hear what you think about the the sort of voluntarily giving up a right stuff first. So thanks. Uh, Thomas. I, um, there are many rights which people uh, can deny to, to use them, so to speak. So uh, 
I don't think that thinking about the possibility that many people can deny to exercise their rights is uh, is sufficient to 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 not pursuing uh, incorporating this right. Uh, for example, is the right to life, and you can you know you can suicide or um, and maybe the following is a controversial opinion, but I think that law has another another possible uh, use, which is the didactical. Uh, if you, of course, if you are introducing new rights that are all, that are uh, yet incorporating into the law, it is uh, it, it makes no sense. But it is something that could be useful in some way, uh, even though if people does not exercise these rights, can be interested about the the, the introduction of a new right. I mean, if, if you introduce uh, introduce a new right in 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 international documents many people will be interested in it. Why are they introducing this right? Why it is important? So I think that it could be a, a, a good use also of this, uh, of this kind of, of, of regulation. Yeah. yeah, so it was, I think it's a little bit different. So look, I have the right, to, I have the freedom of religion and then I choose not to be religious. I, so I have I have the right to bear arms. I don't bear arms. So those are those are rights that I don't uh, I just don't exercise, like you said. But these rights are I want to say the right what I had in mind, like you want to put a you want to give me some sort of brain implant or you want me to wear goggles that will give you information about me that I'm protected from your having. And I'm going to just give the right away to, for instance, a corporate entity, which is different then like my right doesn't go anywhere if I just don't own a gun. I didn't give it to anybody. I just didn't exercise. But here's one where I will like contractually give you the ability to do something that involves the abrogation of the right, which is, I, I take it a bit different. I, they're in the same vicinity. So, but I, so I appreciate the, the, the stuff on the not exercising, I think, makes perfect sense. I was thinking it more along the sort of, but I'm a bit of a skeptic of corporate power and influence. And so um, <laughs> I'm a little bit more worried about the fact that people will just, for the reasons, go back to Adina's question about video games. So now the video games are in the metaverse. These kids might, ha they're, they're having to pay for these video games now. And Facebook says, oh, look, if you just let me do, you know, let me collect this data, you can play all the games you want for free. They, they will, they will like trip over themselves to give away the data that Facebook wants. I mean, that's, I take it. That's, uh, that's a, that I had, it was more that kind of worry, not so much the kind of normal non-exercise thing. Now you might just say that what I'm talking about is still a non-exercise, which is fine. I see what you're talking Um, I think that that uh, I agree that the the most important thing is not the the rights in itself, but what is happening, and what is happening is is uh, there are increasing risks that are uh, new. Just as you know, if people use the metaverse and so, uh, I th I think we are being uh, in English. How how you say in English? Uh, um, uh, when you are being uh, eh? wow. so, prop. so we are being propped like 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 plants in in, in uh, we are that I think that at a new we should think about a new way of of, of, of seeing these things we are not consumer of these kinds of technologies such as social networks and if metaverse that we are, we are producers and people is not aware of this. We are producing data. We are freely producing data, uh, thousands of billions of data. Uh, and we are not being uh, sufficiently aware about this. Uh, I agree with you, we are being slaves. <laughs> so the, the most important is that people be aware of, of this. Uh, of course, yeah. 
Can I ask a, a follow up on Thomas's line of thought? So I'm sort of interested in what the status of these rights are. So when you talk about human rights, um, at one point Thomas said something like, I'm giving you this right. The idea of human rights isn't that, you know, you're just given these rights that are made up, they're supposed to be inalienable things that are, you know, sort of intrinsically yours as as the, in virtue of you being human, right? Um, are we thinking of neuro rights as, you know, a kind of human right, or are we just saying, oh, this is, you know, we can make these up as we wish and say, here, now you have this legal right, but it's not grounded in something, uh, you know, particularly fundamental. Uh well, I agree with the with Yenka and Orno just in that may be useful to incorporate new human rights in, in general documents at the international level. I agree that more concrete measures uh, should be developed and because if we do not work on these other kind of, of uh, regulations, maybe this incorporation just in a you know in a universal declaration of human rights of two new rights or three new rights or so on it could be some kind of of, of, of cosmetic uh, change to the universal declaration of human rights so i think that complementary measures are absolutely necessary Okay, uh, anyone has any more questions? Is there a Zoom questions, Victoria? Okay, so I think we can wrap this up. Uh, big, applause, big applause for Jose Manuel Munoz. I just Thank wanna, you all very much. I, I just want to, to thank Renato, Gabriel, of course, for this incredible uh, conference of this week, for all your efforts to, to make things uh, work uh thank you of course uh, to all of our colleagues here and i want to uh also thank the students for their incredible work these days without them this uh, could not be possible so uh, thank you